<laughs> Welcome to the Teacher's Pep Rally. If you missed our last episode, we had a conversation with social studies teacher and creator of the Daily Bell Ringer, Jared Bruning, about teaching American history with class. Please go back and check it out. And while you're there, leave us a review. We value you and these conversations. Our guest today is a school library media wizard. She lives in Wisconsin and has been an educator for over 14 years. She's a lover of books, a proud supporter of diversity and inclusion. Let's talk about life, learning, and reading. Please welcome to the Teacher's Pep Rally, Kristen Rosenberg. Thank you. So pleased to be here. Yes, this is so great. Okay, well, before we get started, we're going to do our happy happenings, Kristen. So hold tight, and we're going to probably ask you to participate, right, Letitia? Yes, yes. So welcome again, Kristen. We've started doing something here at the Teacher's Pep Rally called Happy Happenings, where we go around our table here, our Zoom table here, and we each share something positive, maybe something that made us smile or laugh during the week, and we share it with each other and with our listeners, all in uh, really around our intentionality about spreading love, happiness, and some light into the world, right? Because this profession can be exhausting. So we're hoping that you have a happy happening to share with us, and we'll kick it off as you get those wheels a turning, Mr. Allen. <laughs> so my happy happening came in a little bit later today, and I was pleasantly informed of one of my students, um, incredibly creative, and I've known him since he was a, a small person because he used to come to my coding camps, but he got accepted into a program for entrepreneurial development because he's competing in a business plan writing competition because he's developing a VR game, and he just got accepted into this very exclusive group of eight people. There are 28 applicants. Wow. He was, and he was one of the eight. And um, it was, I was, I was so, I was, I was so happy for him. Very it's so cool. cool. Yeah. So that was a big, big moment. I was big smiles for everybody. Um, so I'll see him physically tomorrow, but uh, we, we chatted briefly. So it was good. Isn't, that that was my happy happening today. Isn't that awesome? You've been sowing those seeds and yeah. to be able to see this harvest must be so heartwarming. Thank you yeah. so much for good sharing. Stuff. Yeah. I love it. Aaron, what you got this week? Yeah, I'm going to share this one. So I get to help build the agenda to open up conversations for the superintendent advisory councils across my district. And that's with different stakeholders. And so we meet with each of them about once a month. And um, with the students, we it's every other month only because their schedule is so tight. And so today we actually had one with the students and they represent you know, I think 96 schools within our district from all over. And it was just a really great conversation. And once again, I think that this generation of students are very mindful of others more than they are of mm. selfish intentions. And so it was just really great to kind of hear them asking questions with our district leaders that didn't really affect them, but they were they were worried or hoping uh, to take care of their fellow peers. So that was really uh. great. That is so heartwarming, you know, to have just that heart for, for social things, right? And, and we need to lift those things up because I think kids get a bad rap a lot of times, right? Especially in the news this, this week, we've had some really tough things. And so it's great to hear that there are some kids out there that are really adding value and being um, not selfish, but wanting to give back and concern. So thank you, Erin, for sharing that. Well, I'm going to share my happy hap happening and be a total nerd in honor of our library wizard. I could not wait. I finished reading, guys, Wolfpack this week by Abby Wambach. I hope I'm saying her name right. Yep, that's right. Okay, so I don't want to be a total nerd. I've never read a book. First of all, um, 90 something pages of pure power. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt like she was in the room with me. I mean, I cried. I felt loved. I felt her authenticity. I feel like Abby is the real deal. Mm. Yes, I have to buy that. I have yep. to get her next memoir. book forward. And the next yes. book, Julie Foudy. Oh, used to matter. And it's a really it. good one for students, too. I mm. love it. Thank you for sharing that. But I'm telling you, I, I've never 
uh, I don't think I've ever experienced reading a book so powerful that made me feel like literally like she was in the room with me, hmm. encouraging, loving, I mean, cheer like a coach. I mean, heck, she coached me. So I, I just, I was just excited to share that because books are so powerful. And when the author is authentic and transparent and real, it just made the difference. So nice. um, up until this point, never have I read a book that I felt that way. So that is my happy happening. Yes, jazz yes. hands. Pete, what, you, what, what you got for us, Pete? Letitia, I was on board till you said jazz hands. Sorry, I'm out. I'm out. That's it. I'm out of TPR. I know. Um, so uh, I'm going to jump on. I'm going to jump on with uh, my mind fit in really nice with Aaron and Fred's. Uh, a couple of days ago, I had a notification that I was mentioned, tagged, if you will, uh, on a Facebook post. I'm like, what? What's going on? I don't. I don't. I was very uncomfortable with it. I open up, look it up, and it's a student of mine that. Um, gosh, I I haven't seen or heard from her in years and years and years and years. Uh, sweet Melina, I remember her. And uh, she was in our shows in school and uh, she, it was a post, who was your favorite teacher and why? And she, she just put Pete Bush tagged me and then did a sentence or two. And gosh, you know what that does. That was the greatest thing ever. So that was wonderful. That was definitely my happy happening. And I reached out to her. I said, Hey, sweetie, send you a big hug. I hope you're doing well. You know, you remember me. I remember you. Let's catch up. (laughs) You know, I'm old, but I remember you. I'm old. uh, So yeah, that was, that was mine to share. Oh, thank you so much. That is awesome. So we have some more harvest here, right? Yeah, You've yeah. sown into the lives and, and are getting a harvest. So thank you so much for sharing. Right. And if we have any students out there, you know, that or or adults that have uh, teachers that they love, try to reach out, share some love um, if they pop up. So uh, special guests, Kristen, tell us your happy happening. Uh, so, uh, my daughter was homesick today and Mm. she is five Mm. and luckily like my husband works from home. So he was able to be home with her, but I taught her how to send me voice messages. And so, you know, (laughs) all week long, she's been sending me voice messages, mom, come home, (laughs) mom, I miss you. And so today I was like, okay, I'm going to come up with something. Of course, thinking she's going to hate this. She's going to tell me, mom, what are you thinking? But I send her a message and I say, let's make a story together Mm. where one of us sends once upon a time. I love it. I love it. The other person sends, there were three stinky goats. (laughs) And because I know she's in kindergarten and her class has been working really hard on the elements of story, character, plot, problem resolution and she sent me this message of her giggling mom I love this idea and throughout the day we came up with two stories and just like her ideas she took stories in directions that I hadn't thought of and it was just like oh my gosh you magical little being Mm -hmm. You you are learning so much and you're taking it and creating this whole thing. And it was just just hearing her little voice on my phone coming up with all these silly story ideas that that really was so cool. my happy place today. Mm. Oh. Save those. Save yes. those. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 That's brilliant. Great that advice. Awesome. Can you imagine letting let her hear it later on down mm-hmm. the line? That's awesome. Mm. I feel like we had a theme today. With, with our students and, 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 and their richness, what they add value, the value they add in our lives. So that is awesome. So teachers out there, try to pick up some happy happenings, you know, uh, from your own kiddos and let's share those, right? Um, and keep sharing some light into the world. Erin, I know we have a, an amazing episode, so let's get started. Yes, I cannot wait. So Kristen, tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming a school library media wizard (laughs) uh so my official journey toward becoming a librarian probably started around the time when I was four because that's when my mom got her job as a public children's librarian and so there would be times when you know babysitter can't come today go to work with mom and I have 
such fond memories of just like being in the stacks and nobody telling me, oh, don't pick up that. Don't look at that book. You can't read that. Um, and so that was that was extremely formative. But also, as the child of a public librarian, <laughs> I got volunteered for a whole lot of summer reading program <laughs> work. Um, so my my little sister was born uh, 10 years after me. And I came to realize that helping her grow and like teaching her things was really my passion. And so mm. that was where and when I wanted to become um, an educator. Mm. And so while I was in college for my education degree, my mom said, hey, you're home for the summer. Welcome home. You're working at the library. <laughs> and so I started uh, working as the program that they have is called Book Buddies. And mm-hmm. I was the coordinator where older kids read with younger kids and everybody's reading abilities go up. And it was wonderful. That's relevant because the first school that I taught at, the principal came to me and said, I see that you have library experience. We have a library with no librarian. Mm-hmm. You want to become our librarian I was like sure I'm 22 I know what I'm doing and that's when I learned that I didn't (laughs) so um I went back to uh graduate school I got my master in library and information science uh we moved out to Wisconsin um I was a daycare teacher for three years and boy I mean, daycare teachers are some of the best people in the world. Yes. Because they are teaching everything, everything. (laughs) Um, And then I was a a school librarian for three years in Madison. And then I've been a school librarian in my current district for five years now. And the the school library wizard is a bit of a joke um, because it's a line in my email signature. And I put it there partially because nobody ever reads email <laughs> signatures. <laughs> it was That's at least hilarious. a solid year before anybody pointed it out. And I think it was a parent that I was <laughs> corresponding with. Um, but the other thing is, I've had, I, I mean, every day, so many people come into the library and they say, hey, I need this. Can you help me with this? And the answer is almost always, yes, I can. And like mm. magic, I am able to make technology work. I am able to make resources appear. Just today, I got a whole shipment of books that were specifically requested by staff. And so like they found holes in our library that I am now able to fill and share the resources. And cool. the the title of school librarian has changed so much as the job has changed and I just sort of feel like if we can if we can change it to school library media information specialist (laughs) why not just have school library wizard I love it I'm I'm imagining her as like Mickey Mouse and Fantasia even as you're talking about all these magical things that you're doing and is appearing and making sure happens your hands are moving like the sorcerer so that's that was my visual as you were you were telling that story And, and let's not forget to mention the awesome I believe lavender hair it it is right now um I I I run two book fairs and Mm -hmm. for my fundraisers I let students and families donate to vote for the next hair color (laughs) and so uh the last color that one was purple and so it's it's a little faded okay but yeah um, we raise money to buy books for families who might not otherwise be able to get a book i love that in such a fun way it sounds like from the age of four you've been collecting all of this info information so as you kind of evolve through the profession and all its many names what would you say are maybe some challenges um and joys of the job I would definitely say that one of the biggest challenges of the job is public perception. Mm. Um, 
it is still a fact that people will go up to librarians and say, it must be so nice to have a job where you can read all day. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I used to eat lunch at my desk because if I'm not at my desk, the library is kind of closed. (laughs) Um, And something that I've been doing recently is I'll read like middle grade fiction while while I eat my lunch so there was a day when I was eating my lunch at my desk so I was on my lunch break reading a book and a visiting superintendent walks up to me and says working hard oh, yep <laughs> oh love it I was like okay sir hadn't introduced himself hadn't met him I was like okay that's that's a thing um <laughs> and unfortunately that public perception can really impact things like staffing and budget. Mm. Um, If that's all that people think librarians are doing, and unfortunately, a lot of people may have unhappy memories of the way school libraries may have once been. Mm. It's not the kind of library that I'm necessarily trying to run. I used to have a full steam lab. I've got two working 3D printers. Um, I used to have a school podcast that we ran through the library. Um, I, I personally do not like quiet libraries, but because people have that perception, you know, budgets get cut, staff get pulled, and then we're not able to offer as many resources as we might have once done or as many as we might want to. And that can be really challenging to say, I want to do X, Y, Z for you. And unfortunately, I just don't have the capacity. Mm -hmm. But boy, one of my biggest joys is just being able, hmm, something that always happens around this time of year is I get the group of kids who has worked with me enough and trust me enough that they are able to just say, Rosenberg, what do I read next? Hmm. And I can hand them a book and I can say, I couldn't put this down. Hmm. And they will, they won't ask what it's about. They will ask no follow-up questions. They'll just trust me because they know that I'm not going to recommend something that they should read. I'm going to recommend what could potentially be their next favorite book. And just seeing them come back and they're like, oh, I couldn't wait to finish this. And suddenly it's one of my highest circulating books because all their friends are reading it. (laughs) But boy, I tell you what. This last Halloween, I had a moment that, like, I I hope I never forget. I had a group of high school students come up and, you know, you're, you're at my house. I'm giving you candy. <laughs> and a student looks at me and goes, wait a second. Were you my librarian? <laughs> and I go, yes. Oh, my gosh. How are you? And they, they stopped me and they were like, I need to tell you that I think about you every day because you helped me learn who I am and be who I am. And, you know, especially at the age that I was and the family situation that was going on, you just, you helped me learn that it was okay to be me. Mm. And so of course, I'm passing out candy. I'm sobbing. <laughs> the The whole group of kids got a hug, and it was just like, yeah, that's, that's a, why. That's a sweet mm. moment, yeah, Fred. That's were you, great, Fred. Were you going to say something? I can see you percolating. Yeah. So you said two things that really kept me going off in a different direction. First of all, you said that you have a de- an advanced degree. I think you said, or in l- information sciences. Yep. Library so, and information science. I'll come back to that. But, um, and then when you talked about the media and the incorporation of steam, uh, so you've basically have seen that the, the evolution of the library, right. Mm-hmm. Becoming more of the portal than just the, I mean, not, I don't want to say it this way, but the books are wonderful, but you've seen it become something different, right? Oh, absolutely. How, what, what has that been like to live through that, that transition? What has that done for you personally? 
I mean, honestly, it's been a lot of fun. Cool. If yeah, if somebody puts something in front of me and they're like, hey, figure this out, it's it's like a a puzzle. It's yarn to untangle and and make into something wonderful. Um I I absolutely feel like the books part is still great. The kids, yeah. the teachers, the families, they're still coming in for the books. But the fact that I am able to offer so much more is just like somebody says, can you do this? And I'm able to say, yes, I can. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It, it is. And that was my encounter. I, I did a, a weekend coding event and I got to work with the librarian. And that was my first, um, I guess, encounter with our public school, um, having these incredibly rich tools. Like there was 3D, like you said, 3D printers and media and projectors and computers. And I was, I was like a kid in a candy shop for me. That was, that was what I love because I had experienced that at the university level. We've seen that transition where the the library is now becoming what we call the knowledge commons. And, and it's mm. a different, it's a different feel. Um, but that's so cool that you're in the, the middle of that nexus and the books are still pouring. That's, that's also really cool. Mm. Yeah. And if you think about it, the school library or the media center, even on university campus, it's the, it's always the center. It's the yes. center of the building. It's the center of the campus. So I've always have said that to me, that's the heart heart mm -hmm. of the education institution right that's the mm -hmm. like you said it's the portal it's the place where people go to find answers it's where it's it's where they go on a quest to, to you know to find something else to read or to find the knowledge that they need to to expand on whatever they're learning on in class so for me it just makes sense that that's the place and the fact that you were reading during your lunch I love because mm -hmm. isn't that something you want a, a school librarian to do is reading the books that the kids <laughs> have access to so that you can recommend it. You could talk about it. You can get excited about it. Right. Absolutely. That makes, it cool. makes sense to me. So speaking of that, um, we're almost into February. In fact, I think when this will be published, it'll be probably the beginning of February. And mm -hmm. although we always talk about making sure to always celebrate, um, you know, everyone all, all year long, February is black history month. And so I know that you love to do displays, um, uh, on your bookshelves at, in the school library. So can you give us some um, things that maybe are in your, on your display to, to celebrate Black History Month? Absolutely. Um, so one book that I absolutely love is uh, Someday is Now, Clara Looper and the 1958 Oklahoma City Sit-Ins. And it talks all about the teacher and her students who started the, the Oklahoma City Sit-Ins. And not only is it in picture book format, but then at the end, it has like real photographs of the people involved. Um, I've also got Fearless Mary, Mary Fields, American stagecoach driver who... I did not know about this woman until I got to learn about her with my second graders. She was the first African-American woman stagecoach driver, and she never missed a single day of work. Wow. I want to say she did this work for about eight to 10 years in her 60s. Um, and if she could not get her stagecoach through the mountains, she would strap on snowshoes and walk her mail route to deliver the letters and the packages. And apparently she had a pet bald eagle. She's <sighs> like my hero. <laughs> she's I wish. Go ahead. I'm sorry, honey. Oh, just, she's so cool. I was getting ready to say, like, I, I wish my Amazon driver would complain now. <laughs> <laughs> I dare you, bud. Right. She, um, I'm looking at the picture of her brandishing the rifle. She does. I love she it. looks. She looks like a bad dude. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, interesting. it's interesting you said that, Kristen, because I'm thinking of Pete. So last week we had our social studies teacher yep. and we were talking about American history we all shared kind of the the things in American history we're tend to be drawn to. And Pete, that kind of fits yours of, right. you know, the people that we don't typically hear about yes. or, right. or knew about in our history. So that, that fits both of those totally. spaces. Yes. Um, I've also got 
uh, so I now have two biographies of Bayard Rustin. Um, one just came, like literally just got delivered to me this morning and it's called A Song for the Unsung. And I haven't actually gotten a chance to read it yet, but it looks amazing. Mm. Um, you know, he was somebody who was really influential and helpful to Martin Luther King Jr. And he was a gay African-American man at a time when, I mean, I can say at a time when that wouldn't have been easy to be, but well. has it been a time right. when that's easy to be? Right. And um, let me see, let me pull one more box. Henry Brown mails himself to freedom. The story of Henry Brown, who uh, was an enslaved man. And he, he literally, he and his friends built a a box and put him in it and he shipped himself to the the north unfortunately i'm missing some of the details but just the experience that he had to go through and and you know when i use this book with kids a lot of times i'll get the kids being like oh man uh would it have been worth it to go through all that? And I'm like, y'all, his family was sold away from him. At what point does he have anything else to lose? Right. Um, and it's just a really amazing story. Wow. I just wrote all those down yep. and I have been using my library uh digital access so i'm gonna go and find all of those and put them on hold that's a that's a great list and i tell you what Kristen, i um i asked the tpr crew because i got really excited about about books um and i said are there any books that that they recommend so to, as well to honor black history month um pete fred letitia did you did you bring one to the table that you want to share I, I I have I'm sorry go ahead let's issue no no you're fine you're fine I just was gonna say I don't know if it's a, it's necessarily not necessarily a book but it is an individual so I'm in the the coding space and and you know the software space hardware space mm -hmm. and uh the person that you know I was revisiting was somebody that I was introduced to about a year ago and that was uh Jerry Lee, Jerry Lawless so Jerry Lawson or sorry Jerry Lawson was a he was an engineer who was given uh credit for creating the video game cartridge but what is really interesting about his story is, he, you know, he grew up in the city, um, not a lot of role models, but yet managed to get into a, a pretty tough industry as an engineer and work for one of the largest semiconductor manufacturers in the world. And so that was Fairchild. Um, and then, and what I think is really cool is the fact that his legacy is kids are involved in that same field. So I think they just kind of caught some of his DNA juice and they said they we want to continue this on, but it's, it's a really fun story to kind of, and it surfaces every year because they, they do a Google did a, um, uh, what do you call the, uh, I think it was doodles, doodle? the doodles. There. Yes. Yes. And that was, he popped up here a few weeks ago. And then, uh, so yeah, that's somebody that I, I kind of, uh, became aware of in the past few years. And his story is one that you kind of wish you knew much longer, you know, it's a, it's, but it's fun to discover these things too. So. Absolutely. How about you, Letitia? I love that. So, you know, my overachieving self, I was okay. like, I need to recommend an adult book and then a young adult book for everyone. So the whole family can read. So actually Jared uh, inspired me last week because uh, to your point earlier, Aaron, he gave us a list of all these amazing heroes we'd not heard of. And so I actually purchased All Blood Runs Red, mm -hmm. and it's the life of Eugene Bullard, who was a boxer pilot, soldier, and a spy. And actually from here, right here from Georgia. So I thought that was cool. So I'll be, uh, I'm recommending that and I'll be reading it. And then for our young adults, I pulled Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You. Um, which I know it can be a hard read, especially the times we're living in now, but it's, it's really about, you know, teaching us about racism, how it started, how it spread, and then moving toward just a better future for all of us. Uh, and so uh, that's my, my uh, recommendation for young adults, which I will be reading both of these myself. And I know we'll talk about maybe how books are being banned in a little bit. And so maybe we can touch base, but those yeah. are mine. 
And by the My way, recommendations. The, the second book you mentioned, you got a big old nod from our library wizard. I don't know if you noticed that. So, oh yes. Right now, you're the, the wizard is <laughs> loving on me. <laughs> How about you, Pete? So you know me. I go in a different direction. Um, I, I was it. thinking of of movies or plays, and I was basing it on what we talked about last week, the stories that haven't been told yet. And I was going in the vein of uh, the movie, was it Real Heroes that was out a few years ago? Uh, the 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 ladies, the four ladies. I'm trying to think of the name. Uh, of the hidden figures. figures. Yeah, hidden, hidden figures. figures. Here it is. There's it. We were talking about it at lunch today. Um, and I said, I want to find that story. And I was doing some research. And my my dear art teacher friend who's been on the show, Patsy, uh, she said, Do you know the story of Ed Dwight? And I said, No, tell me about it. So Edward Joseph Dwight Jr. Um American sculptor, author, and former test pilot. He's the first African-American to have entered the Air Force training program uh, from which NASA selected astronauts. And he really wow. should have been up there. And over and over and over and over, he got screwed. Um, and he was controversially not selected to officially join NASA. And through uh, all of these... Oh, there she is. What a cutie. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, sweetie. Hello. There's our oh, writer, there's our future there. writer. There's wizard. the future writer. We're going to be talking about you someday. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was so inspired because uh, the art teacher found him because he, through all these setbacks and these wrongdoings, he discovered a gigantic love for art, specifically mm. sculpture. And he is still alive. And I love <gasps> learning from people who are still alive. Yes, <laughs> They're yeah. much more valuable to us. So this is uh, somebody that if there is not a book, a play or a movie written about him, I think the story would be quite a uh, wonderful subject. So I, I, I highly recommend you guys look up Ed Dwight. Really great story. Nice. Thank cool. you, Pete. That's awesome. I like those. All right. Well, those are all tough to beat. Uh, but I will add to I will add to it because we can never have too many books. Um, I love anything by Zora Neale Hurston. Um, and mm. I always loved uh, for my high school kiddos to do their eyes were watching God. I just think mm. it's just beautifully written. Um, there's the the little town Eatonville, which is outside of Orlando. I've gone and uh, there they have a museum for her because uh, that's where she lived for a while. It was our first all black incorporated run neighborhood in the United States. So if you ever go down to Disney world, make sure you stop by there and check it out. And they usually have like a really big um, festival as well. Um, I really love a book that came out a couple of years ago called King and the Fireflies um, by Case and Callender. Yeah, Kristen's <laughs> you know, holding her chest. That was I, one of my lunch books. Oh my gosh. It was one of those where I just kind of discovered it, didn't really know much about it. And as I was reading it, I would stop every now and again, looking around like, who else do I need to tell about this book? It is just, it's just so beautiful. Um, King and the Fireflies. Mm. And then lastly, I really like the March graphic novel series that was done by John Lewis. And um, it, anyone can pick it up, pick it up in any series. You don't, you don't, I mean, it's great to read it in order, but if you just pick up book number three and read it, that that's fine as well. And us in Georgia, we're so close to Selma and Alabama. Um, as you're reading it or after you read it, you can go visit some of those historic places that that, that are talked about. So um very so cool. many books, Kristen. So many books. I'm I'm curious, do you have displays for other things, traditional, non-traditional throughout the year? And if so, can you give us some ideas of what we should be doing? <laughs> Uh, well, of course, this is this is uh, your mileage may vary and, and do with it what you will. Um, something that my district did, which has been really joyful over the past couple of years, is we the, the librarians together have worked on what we call an anti-racist calendar. And so we have looked at you know, each month of the year, and we have tried to find different holidays, observances that specifically feature uh, traditionally marginalized and intentionally mm. exploited people. Um, so we put together um, lists of resources that get shared out with the community but that's really my number one display is I try to find um, all the 
best resources that I can that go with the observances of the month. So whether it's World Day of Muslim Culture, Peace, Dialogue, and Film, or mm. um, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Um, I put those on display and I've got signs all over saying, hey, check these out. And it's always really rewarding when one of those uh, goes out and circulates. Honestly, otherwise, most of my other displays are just what's new, um, because those are often books that I am the most excited about. Um, I very quietly believe that librarians are chaotic good. If you are aware of the, the way that you are able to make a character like lawful good, chaotic good, neutral good, etc. Um, and, you know, I just really love buying resources that um, maybe aren't quite typical. Maybe, you know, it's got the boy in the skirt or the girl with the shaved head or the kid with parents of different races, just, just little things like that. So that's, to be honest, one of the reasons why I enjoy having my new book displays. That's cool. And my goodness, there are so many amazing new books coming out. I really feel like We Need Diverse Books has been such a push in the last few years. And, you know, the book publishing process is slow, but it's it's definitely, I've been seeing results. If somebody says, I need a book with this kind of character, more and more, I am able to find more and more. So, Kristen, so I want to jump on that. I love your energy. I'm on the same page as you. How do you keep going with that? How do you navigate that with the uptick of mm -hmm. banned books, of the more critical eyes, the more vocal parents, the restrictions being put on us? How do you deal with that and still, still try to keep that energy going? <laughs> <laughs> For those who did not the see The best that. answer ever on TPR. <laughs> no. and you must watch our YouTube channel. <laughs> yes, 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 right. Go straight to the channel. Oh. <laughs> Throughout all of the challenges that I have seen in my time as an educator, and I, I really still consider myself to be a baby educator. Um, I call myself three toddlers in a trench coat with a master of library and information science. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's an incredible visual, by the way. It is. <laughs> I love it. Um, I just try to remember hope. Mm. And like, there are genuinely some days when like, if I can picture the word hope, it's a little something, it's just a little mental trick that reminds me that we're still here and we can keep trying. But externally, what really keeps me going is the students and the families, the students who trust me to know that I am going to pick something that fits them, um, the families who reach out and say, hey, we're going through a, a sensitive time and we could really use resources. Um, have you heard of this title? Can you get this title for us? Or can you recommend anything that we can read as a family? Hmm. Or can you recommend anything that you can give to the teacher and they can read as a class? Um, I, I love being able to uh, offer teachers books like It Feels Good. No, mm, it feels good to be who you are. Oh, Teresa Thorne, help me. It's one of my favorite books to recommend and I'm worried that I'm butchering the title, but it's it's just a book about like, hey, this person is this way and they feel good about it. And this person is this way and it feels good about it. Um, and it, it doesn't talk down, but it talks very matter of fact. And I will say um, I am in a state and a district where I have the support to do these things. I do not feel like I am risking my job to do these things. And 
the fact that not every librarian can say that really breaks my heart. I feel like one of the other biggest ways that I am I am able to keep doing this is really just showing up every day for the students and knowing that the the day that a fourth grade student comes up to me and cheerfully says, hi, Rosenberg, I'm asexual. They know that I'm not going to go, whoa, hold on, you are way too young to even be thinking about that. Don't like, I, I go, oh, that's great that you know that about yourself. Um, yeah. and, and just being a safe place for students to come to and, and knowing that this is a time in history and I, I have a very small sphere of influence, but just because it is small mm -hmm. does not mean that my influence doesn't matter. I don't think your sphere is as small as you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you found me, so right? it's a little bit bigger than I expected. Yeah, for sure. And, mm -hmm. and I think just the fact that you keep bringing up this idea of opening a space that's welcoming, that's probably just the biggest thing is, is for educators to do. You know, I, I do a lot of stuff on the policy end. So I'm constantly reading about everything that's going on, uh, not just on in the state that I live in, but just across across the nation. And so for educators that are really worried or in a state or or in a district where it feels like um, it's scary and they're they're afraid, you know, maybe to open up those spaces or or have the books, um, a wide variety of books and resources for people. I think the biggest thing is, is to just make sure you're engaging families. You're already probably doing that, right? Uh, make sure that you provide vast resources, which Kristen, you know, you, you mentioned as well, um, for families and for students. Build those relationships, which all of us are doing. So just keep keep doing that, right? Um, make sure you're communicating. And then I think most importantly, just our districts just have to share what's available. You know, they just mm -hmm. have to share what's available. And we do our best of trying to have as many things as we can available. But at the end of the day, if, if, a, if a parent says they don't want their child to read something, then, you know, that, that's their right. We just have to try to do our best to, to provide alternative materials or support that child in, in some other way uh, if that's needed. But it, it is tough. It is tough right now. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I love that you kind of wrapped it up really nicely there, Erin, right? Because... Uh, you guys know this, I tend to be a pretty positive person. And when I walk into a bookstore and there's a, there are two large tables <laughs> that says these are banned in the, at the library, you know, so that people can buy them in public. I mean, that, that just made my heart sink that we actually have this going on in our country. But, you know, this conversation is, is encouraging me because to your point, Aaron, we just have to keep sharing, keep doing. And even though, you know, as a therapist, obviously, you know, I have some influence, right? If a kid comes to me and I'm the only person that, or one of the few that knows how they identify, you know, these great books help me, you know, because then I can, in my sphere of influence, say, hey, think about this book or, you know, what, you know, whatever. So I just think we can all play a part um, in, in just supporting folks that don't look like us <laughs> or think like us or identify like us. You know, it, I know it's complex, but thank you guys for encouraging me tonight. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, you know, I, I do want to ask you though, Kristen, so you were obviously bitten by the bug really early and your, your, your parent, your mom was a librarian. So the breeding seems like it was always part of your life, but you know, I'm at my end of the, of the education spectrum, students don't like to read. Um, and we're challenged by that in so many ways. And we, mm. you know, I'm not saying all the students, but definitely in the tech sector, they don't want to read. Um, so, but yet they're taking their general education courses where they will be reading. And for some of them coming out of high school into college, it's like hitting a, it's like hitting a wall. Something changes in junior, senior year, um, reading declines. 
and they come into our space and it's, it's like, we're really trying to pull an elephant through a keyhole. So are, what, what do you think are real effective ways to inspire reading, whether in the home with parents or how, how, even when they get to my level, again, at the older age, how do you get them back into interested in reading? Cause there's so much out there that they could be gaining and they don't seem to be interested. So I listened to another podcast called Reading Glasses, and one of the questions they get the most is, I just finished grad school, and I can't pick up a book. What do I do? Because sometimes through assigned reading, higher education can really kill the love of reading. And, And that happened to me, too. There were years when I don't know if I could tell you what I had read because it was picture books or nothing. And my number one thing to get a reluctant reader in is graphic novels. I love them. After my daughter was born, I had really bad postpartum depression graphic novels got me to read again (laughs) that's a great tip yep and you know people are like oh but you're just looking at the pictures pictures can be text it can tell so much about a story somebody said oh but you don't get as much of the story as you do in a graphic novel no you get so much more because you don't need half a page to explain how jenny turned and looked over her shoulder and her (laughs) hair waved you can get that in two frames and it tells so much of the story you're you're able to use so much more higher vocabulary in graphic novels because the illustrations support the reading and the art the art i i will admit i do sometimes read graphic novels for the art, the illustrations, because the stories they tell in in the stroke of a pen and the ink of a brush is just beautiful. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, agree. I, also, I also super love audiobooks. I believe that, you know, if you are actively working on reading fluency and decoding skills and visual comprehension. Okay, an audiobook isn't going to be what you're going for. If you just want to take in the story, audiobooks are great. Right. Um, because then you don't have to struggle with the, I'm looking at a page and I've been looking at the same page for <laughs> three hours now. Yeah. When you it know comes, me too well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know myself, and that is absolutely something that I've had to struggle with. Um, I would nice. say as far as getting a student to um, pick up something voluntarily, I try really hard to find out what the kid enjoys. Okay, when you are at home, you play X, Y, and Z video game. Oh, those video games are really adventure-based. That tells me that you enjoy adventure stories. Let's go look at our adventure books. And another thing that I do is, even if I know I have a perfect fit book for a kiddo, if in that moment they are telling me no, I listen because they get to be the ultimate decision makers and I'm not taking that away from them and the more that I'm able to do that the sooner the student comes to trust that oh okay she's not reading this because she thinks I need to she's reading if she's recommending it because she actually thinks I'll enjoy it And I have gotten some students to read some books that are really like, they look at the cover and they're like, really? This? And I'm able to say, oh, yeah, it's got this element and this element. And the the main character does this, this, and this. And they go, oh, that sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Right. That's awesome. Another cool thing is um, in my classroom, I always had the kids, if they finished a book, 
and loved it, whether it was from my classroom, you know, library or for the independent reading project, if they really loved the book and they wanted to let other people know it, just like you would see like at Barnes and Noble or anything where it's mm -hmm. the employees there recommend books and do a write up. Uh -huh. So I'd have the kids do the write up about it. Mm -hmm. Like, why did you love this book? Give a little synopsis of what it's about. And then I would be like, can I take your picture? And so I'd take <laughs> their picture and I'd print it off of them holding the book. And then that way two other kids could see like, if it's a friend of theirs or someone that looks like them or that they know has the same interest, sometimes they would pick that book up and take it just be just because, you know, their their peers liked it, right? Or mm -hmm. made the recommendation. Very cool. So, really cool. And you know, oh my gosh. I can so why yeah, go I'm ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I'm so pumped up. I'm sorry. I, but I, what I was thinking of, and I know that we, Fred posed the question, and Kristen, you said, you know, uh, uh, the, the early elementary or like the pre-K teachers, they do all the teaching, right? Like that's where the foundation is. And as you guys were talking and sharing, you know, this is like a journey, yeah. right? When they get to college, what has that experience been? And I, you know, I hate to say it, but sometimes they get to college and they can't read. Mm -hmm. right or you know it hasn't you know they haven't had the library wizard or the Aaron you know really like those experiences matter right um, and and you know and, and but you know for, you just said some, you said something really important Letitia and that is um the distinction between they they can't read meaning they can't read the words but then they could read the words but they don't know what it means comprehension comprehension absolutely. exactly all and that's, this stuff matters right and yeah, then the yeah. more years they go through school right? They know that they don't understand what they're reading. So then right. there's that shame. So I, I feel like it's this beautiful experience where we have to flood kids, which is another reason I love your, you know, your, um, your uh, fundraising for books, mm -hmm. just filling kids with books and exposure. And I, I've been very transparent. I, I didn't, I didn't finish my first novel till I was maybe 22, right before my daughter was born. Because I had those challenges and I didn't want her to have a dumb mom. So I, re so I read The Firm by John Gresham, who <laughs> holds a special place in my heart. It's a good one. Mm. Right? But, but you know, we don't talk. It's like a shame and a thing that we don't talk about. And I just want to encourage decision yeah. makers, right? As you said earlier, Kristen, that's this misconception, how valuable and important you are. You know, so you don't have kids in Fred's <laughs> college classroom or me yeah. about to be a mom and never finish the novel from beginning to end. Yeah. You know, so I, I think, you know, we got to connect the dots here um, and just saturate our, our environments with reading and exposure and support. Yeah, absolutely. I think, it, I think it highlights that role, Letitia, again, how it... Whether we want to recognize it or not, the special role educators, media specialists play Absolutely. in kids' lives throughout that journey. So I'm curious, Kristen, here, this is like my favorite part of the of all of our conversations with our guests. Is there a teacher, a coach, a mentor, someone from growing up that you want to shout out, tell us about that maybe made you the wizard you are today or the 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 person you are today? Please, please tell us. Hands down, Mrs. Francis. Francis. Mrs. Francis <laughs> was my fourth, fifth, and sixth grade enrichment teacher. Mm. Um, uh, when I went to elementary school, if you got into the enrichment program, once a week, you were able to go to a completely different building. And I can still, I can still like smell the old radiators and like the, the creaky wooden stairs. And Mrs. Francis was, I mean, she was my person who made me feel like mm. awkward, nerdy, weird me was okay. Um, she... Oh, she gave us so many tools and, and then would say, go make, go make something wonderful <laughs> and, and would help us every step of the way. And I just, I, I love her so much. Mm, that's good. I like that one. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, so now's the part, Kristen, where we're going to each, I, I saw all of us taking some notes. If you saw us sitting and writing stuff down, 
you know, throughout the conversation, if, if there's something that uh, comes up that sparks our interest or whatever, we write it down. So if it's okay, we're going to go around and just give one little thing or takeaway and then use our guests kind of get the last word. Does that sound good? Absolutely. Okay. Pete, I'm going to have you go first. Yeah. So tonight I learned Wizard of the Knowledge Commons could be a real <laughs> kick-ass job title. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to cross-stitch yes. that. Get yes. that out there. Come on. Can't get that and, at Marshall's. And oh my gosh, Kristen, if you and I were in the same building, holy cow, that yes. would be that would be amazing. We would have such amazing. Oh, I said amazing too many times. It would be awesome. Uh, so let's see. My thing I wrote down was earlier on. I did. Uh, they just trust me because they know I'll recommend what could potentially be their new favorite. Uh, and then also, you helped me learn it was okay to be me. That's mm. it. Drop the mic. There's not much more That's else. That's right. That 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 really is amazing. So That's good. thank you. That's good choice. That's good, Pete. I like it. Nice. How about you, Letitia? I love that. I love that. Yes, I can. That's one of my. You need to coin that. Yes, I can. Yes. How many jobs can you say yes, I can that many times? <laughs> I love it. Um. Uh. My my favorite quote I think tonight was although my sphere of influence is small, doesn't mean it doesn't matter. Mm. Um. Although I would add Fred's caveat to that is that your sphere is bigger, larger than you think. Mm. Um. And I hope that you know I'm all about recreating childhood uh, memories you know, things that I didn't experience. So I never had a librarian. I never had a wizard. So I hope you'll be my wizard. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> I'll be bugging you for books and recommendations Please. and resources. I love it. Thank you, my dear, for your service. And Appreciate by the it. way, Letitia, I think she has an even longer book list. <laughs> she's going to share with our listeners. She was like, I couldn't narrow it down. I'm like, that's fine. I totally get it. <laughs> I have a librarian. Place. Yes. So yes. we'll be posting that. How about you, Fred? There's so many things, right? So for, first of all, thank you, Kristen, for being here tonight. And you've, you've um, actually surfaced a really good memory for me, Mrs. Baum, mm. and my sixth and seventh grade librarian who introduced me to the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and the Chronicles mm. of Narnia. So, yeah, so that, and, you know, and the way she did it was during homeroom, we got 10 minutes to kind of like do what we wanted, I guess, at that time. And we would go to the library and that's where we would be for 10 minutes. And and that's where she managed to impress us. So that's what you do. You have that ability to impress people Mm -hmm. that's going to affect them for the rest of their lives. Um, So that's, that's wonderful. You're lucky. You're a very lucky person. Um, So I I think there's... First of all, the, the toddlers in the trench coat. Ah, that's the that's the big thing right there. That's my big takeaway. <laughs> Three toddlers in a trench coat with an information sciences degree, a, ma- a massive information science degree, right? Um, but I think also there was something that t- towards the end there when you were kind of paraphrasing some things, but you listen even when they say no. Mm-hmm. And and I think that's a great reminder for, for all teachers everywhere, yes. right? Because we're always bumping into the, that that edge. And instead of battling it, you know, mm-hmm. remind us to, okay, we're going to hear you out. You are going to make the decisions and we just got to kind of end run them a little bit, I guess. Um, not trick them, but hear them out kind of, and then subtly guide them around, you know, and that's, and that, that's a great reminder. So thank you for that. Yes. Respect the no. I love yeah. it. So I wrote down li- librarians are heroes of creating chaotic good. Uh, good that one. was my favorite. <laughs> That's because a good one. Though. Being humans, messy. <laughs> mm-hmm. we're, we're not perfect. We're all different. We all have things that we can relate to that are the same. But isn't it more fun to just go through life with the chaotic good and yes. just trying to just weed through it to to find connections and just be kind and love each other? So that was my my favorite part. Um, Kristen, thank you so much for being here. Um, You as our guest, like I said, you kind of get the last word. If there's something you feel like you didn't get a chance to say or something that came from the conversation, uh, feel free. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me. I I feel like one one thing I'm going to take away uh, from this is, Letitia, what you said about your first novel being The Firm. (laughs) Talk about jumping into the deep end yeah, that's not like lifting no. and your motivation <laughs> was your daughter and I feel like there is so much so much good that we can do when 
we we hold the future with us when we hold our children with us and and just mm -hmm. keeping in mind that we want to have have their lives be the best that they can be if not better than ours I, I want my daughter to have more rights than I had. I want our students to have more books than I had. And I, I feel like when we are able to even not, not even necessarily keep that consciously in our minds, but when we are able to do that, we are, we are able to make things better. Agreed. Well said. Mm. Well said. Very well said. Very well said. Kristen, if our listeners want to connect with you like uh, the rest of us and continue <laughs> to see what books we should be reading, where can they find you? Okay, so my first recommendation is find me on Twitter at Rosenberg Reads and then follow everybody I follow because they're where I, they are where I steal all my ideas from. So, <laughs> oh my gosh. I've got to say, I'm actually glad that, you know, Twitter's still kicking because I love my professional learning network there. There are so many people who post book recommendations, organization, yada, yada, yada. So yeah, uh, Rosenberg reads on Twitter, or I'm sorry, <laughs> my, my official handle is actually reads Rosenberg because I thought I put in Rosenberg reads and I made a mistake. So uh, Rosenberg mm, reads Rosenberg on Twitter, <laughs> or I do also have a public work Facebook account also at Rosenberg reads. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. And I tell you what, so listeners, because they knew we were going to have the library wizard uh, novel effect has given us something that we want to give to you for free. So we are doing a uh, giveaway for a free one-year premium subscription for Novel wow. Effect. And in order to enter the drawing this week with the Teacher's Pep Rally podcast, you must do three things. Really easy. One, make sure you're following us on the Teacher's Pep Rally Facebook group. Two, introduce yourself to the group. Three. Tell us your favorite book. Give us one of your favorite books. Um, the contest is going to end on February 7th. So don't miss out on this amazing chance for a free reading tool. We're very excited about this. And Pete, where else can they uh, continue to find us and collaborate with us? Wherever you're listening to us, leave us a review. Like Aaron just said, join our Facebook group. Subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on our Instagram account. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Kristen, for being here. We loved having you. Thank you so much for having me. This was really an honor. Good. We loved it. All right. Oh, thanks for being here. <laughs>